This presentation explores women's fashions in the Jazz Age, the 1920s. The Jazz Age glorified city life. Americans, including many African Americans from the South, left their farms in record numbers to live and work in places like Chicago and New York, forever changing the culture of American cities. F. Scott Fitzgerald called it a time when the parties were bigger, the pace was faster, the buildings were higher, the morals looser. The predominant shape for this decade will be the H shape with a lower waistline around the hip. The dresses will divide into two rectangles, one at the top and one at the bottom. The bust line will minimize for a youthful ideal figure. With minimal fit, dresses are now canvases featuring dressmaker details and decoration. Some techniques we will see are smocking, shirring, or pleating, which is gathering fabric, printed textiles, and the use of negative space, and layers of fabric that imitate the step-back insets so predominant in Art Deco architecture. The dress as canvas idea will make room for incredible surface treatments such as beadwork and embroidery. Beaded dresses become the signature item we associate with this era. We will see four silhouettes in this decade and some will overlap with each other. The first is the sheath silhouette. The simple chemise dress of the last years of the 19 teens elongates and straightens and dresses hang from the shoulders in slender columns. The waist drops to the high hip, although visual interest drops lower. Necklines and decor will have a horizontal emphasis and the hemline is to the lower or mid calf. There is an option for more than one layer with different hem lengths, as we can see on the, in the center and on the left. This carries over from the 19 teens as well. The second silhouette is the flapper style, beginning in 1925. This short knee length is the shortest fashion will go in the 20s, but it is the one we most associate in the popular imagination with this decade. Note that it takes us half a decade to reach this hemline. The waistline drops to the low hip, so the torso is a long rectangle. Skirts will flare below the fullest part of the hip with pleats or other kinds of fullness. And the neckline will feature V-shaped necklines along with some horizontals. We will see a huge variety of skirt treatments during this era as visual interest drops below the waist. Sporty pleats, tailored versions can have plain skirts, feminine skirts can feature ruffles, Arty skirts could feature geometric setback surfaces divided like Art Deco patterns. Note the hemlines all line up in this photo. The fashion press publicized what this year's hem length would be and women hemmed their skirts to follow fashion. We will see a style rebellion against the straightened fashions for women. Women who want a more traditional feminine way of dressing adopt what's called the robe de style, and it revives the tunic line or minaret line from the 19 teens with a more traditional waistline and volume around the hip. The most extreme version is a revival of the 18th century rococo panier. These styles were party dresses we can see the version that could be worn as day dresses on the right. The waist will stay at the low natural waist or the high hip line. The skirt will flare from the waist and over the hips. Hems are long for party dresses and mid shin on day dresses or just below the knee. The robe de style was particularly championed by couturier Jean Lanvin. As gender differences waned, she was determined to give women a feminine alternative. This style was used for conservative styles or for formal styles like weddings and dances, just like we wear formal styles today that we do not wear on the street. This would be considered a more festive or party style. 
The larger robe de steel was shaped by very lightweight panniers, although smaller styles could just sew pads and ruffles inside the hips for comfort. There is one variation of the robe de steel that features a short hem in the front and a long hem in the back. At that time, it was called an intermission hem. The final silhouette is the last of the decade featuring dynamic diagonals and soft skirts. The cut of dresses will soften and feature draping. Low wide hip bands or hip pieces create a, an emphasis around the hip. It features complex seaming or layers and skirts. Hems can be pointed or contain circular ruffles. The torso portion may blouse a little where it attaches to the skirt, creating a little air under the fabric so it's not too form-fitting. And notice we also feature asymmetrical drapes and scarves. There's no apparent waist in this style, and some styles feature layers of chiffon over a solid underdress. We see some vertical ruffles on the left called waterfall ruffles, and the hems will point in several places around the skirt. This is called a handkerchief hem, as if you picked up a square scarf from the center, letting the corners drop down. We will also see high-low or intermission hems in this silhouette. How do all these skirts stay up if the waistline has dropped to the hip? It's very difficult to park a skirt on the low hip and not have it slide off. The answer is that many dresses had a slip top sewn to the skirt to hold it at exactly the right place on the hips. You can see examples of this on either side of this advertisement. Another option for a woman wearing a sweater and skirt is to wear the skirt up at the normal waistline, allowing the sweater to blouse or lay over the top of it. Notice how the top section of the skirt is sewn into a smooth yoke to avoid adding bulk over the stomach and so the pleats will hang correctly. Many sporting ensembles were made as one sheath dress from shoulder to skirt to aid movement that a sweater could be added over. Underwear is designed to minimize the figure to create the androgynous or youthful look. On the left, we see a full girdle designed to reduce the hips and flatten the bust. Notice there is nothing to support a smaller waistline. In the center is a bandeau, also made to minimize if your bust was more full. On the right, we see a 1920s brassiere that provides minimal support for the woman who already owns the correct youthful shape. Underwear is still available in one piece called a teddy or step-in. The latest style is two pieces, a bra and petty pants. We tend to call these tap pants today. By the end of the decade, hosiery improves in quality. It is more sheer and hugs the leg better for a natural appearance. It is now possible to somewhat match the hosiery to your skin tone, although many colors were marketed by season. Regardless of her own skin tone, a woman may wear colors to match her dress or to provide an accent color. On the right, we can see three flappers with different colors stockings. The average woman still wore a girdle over her petty pants, although it has shrunk in size from the 19 teens. Girdles had garter clips to hold the stockings. The latest craze for flappers was to roll the stockings just over the knee to free the legs for more movement in dancing. Elastic garters hold the stockings in place. This was a daring style as it bared some skin. Stockings are now available with patterns or even in open work designs for sports activities. With short skirts and sheer hose, the beauty industry targeted women to remove or shave their legs. It appears that women may have done this for summer, but not necessarily all year round when they wore heavy stockings. It will not be widespread until the 1950s. And I just couldn't resist this news article about a girl who cut herself shaving her legs because of open stockings. 
Women's Swimwear once again tells a story of how much freedom or rebellion women manage. Swimwear and the beach continues to be a moral battleground with local officials enforcing self-styled norms of decency. In the 1920s, women adapt the wool jersey bathing suit worn by men, giving up the skirts and bloomers from the 19-teens. The typical women's version was a longer tunic and shorts to provide modesty. We now see much more leg up to the top of the thigh. Coat shapes in the late 19-teens and 1920s evolve into two basic styles. One is a straight sheath imitating the cut of dresses or more tailored versions. The visual emphasis is at the neck and shoulder with large collars or furs. Many coats feature a dramatic asymmetrical closure with just one or two buttons placed low at the hip line. The cocoon coat was by far the more sophisticated or dramatic style, originating with Paul Poiret's 19-teens Scheherazade styles. It translated to general fashion with more modified styles. It featured wider collars and shoulders and a narrow hem. The 1920s version on the right is called a clutch coat because it had no closures and one had to clutch it closed if dashing between the car and the front door. Hats are still required whenever leaving home for a social event. We will see a number of hat styles in the 1920s. One of the most popular is the broad-brimmed hat or mushroom hat with a large squashy crown. It curves toward the face and can be made of fabric, felt, or straw. As part of an 18th century revival with the robe de steel, bicorns and tricorns become popular with emphasis on the sides as seen on the right. On the left, we have a musketeer hat, a broad brimmed hat with the brim pushed up, forming a canvas for decoration. The toque remains a popular style. As does the tam or beret, especially for young women or sports. These are affordable and can even be made at home, so they are a popular choice for working class women or students. The newest hat is the cloche, and it will become the signature hat from this era. It features a rounded crown that fits tightly over the whole head, sitting just above the eyes or even shading the eyes. This is a popular style for women with short hair because the hat can sit closely to the head. Women now have a lot to carry around, car keys, cosmetics, and money. Purses become the perfect canvas for art deco motifs. Purses are available in hard or soft sides with or without a handle. A new accessory for women is compacts to hold makeup and cigarettes with all manner of clever cigarette caddies available. I love the one on the left, an entire purse that opens up to reveal cigarettes and a lighter. Makeup was not approved for decent women before the 1920s, although many women had tricks to help their appearance, such as crushed rose petals for rouge. Overt use of makeup had not been worn since the French Revolution. From now on, however, makeup will shape the colors and ideals for each decade, and women must mold their faces to fashion. The ideal face shape for the 1920s is the heart-shaped face with a pointed chin. 1920s makeup included a dark, smoky eye and Egyptian-inspired eyeliner. Eyebrows were thin and widely arched, drawn in thin lines. Lipstick had been used all through history but fell out of favor in the Victorian era and it was not acceptable for the average woman to wear. It was associated with actors and prostitutes being a painted lady was a euphemism for a sex worker. Silent film brought made up faces to the masses who began to adopt makeup in the very late teens. The invention of 
portable lipstick tubes made it easier for active women to wear and it became more acceptable in the 1920s, as did powder and rouge. The ability to alter the face allowed fashion to dictate perfect features. The perfect lip shape elongated the points at the top of the lip and shortened the edges to create what was called a cupid's bow or a bee sting lip, as if the lips were swollen. If you look very carefully, you can detect the natural lip line under the lipstick in this photograph. Nail polish was another thing that respectable people began to use. Manicures before this required a multi-step process of sanding and buffing the actual nail. Now shine and color could be had from a bottle. The most fashionable manicure created two white portions on the nail, a half moon at the base of the nail and one on the portion of the nail that grew past the fingertip. I find this color blocking to be particularly art deco. Male movie stars routinely appeared in makeup to aid their features in black and white film, but they also wore makeup in their headshots to lend glamour and romance. The use of cosmetics to enhance a man's face was not questioned for worldwide publicity, and some even wore light makeup on the street to aid their appearance. This practice was not questioned, although it is difficult for us to imagine Brad Pitt or Chris Evans marketed in Hollywood press releases with a smoky eye. The window for stars to wear obvious makeup closes for men in the 1940s and World War II when a hyper-masculinity returns to Western culture. Shoes remain available in Oxford styles for walking or pumps. Under the influence of Art Deco, many shoe styles are decorated with color blocking. Pumps also develop straps that form cutout patterns on the foot, an extension of Art Deco's interest in transparency and surfaces. With higher hems, extra decoration can be added to the shoes, again borrowing from the 18th century Rococo revival. Bows, feathers, and buckles are made as part of the shoe or can be moved from one shoe to another. High heels make a debut under the influence of French shoe designer André Perugia. These were worn by entertainers and a very fashion-forward crowd, but they were not considered a requirement in everyday fashion. Let's conclude our look at women's fashions in the 1920s by looking at a collection of influential women in the arts and Hollywood. They referred to themselves as being part of a sewing circle. Sewing circles refers to a group of women that gather to create sewing projects together, and the name was adopted by groups of closeted lesbian and bisexual women in film. Gay culture was an open secret in the arts worlds of New York and Hollywood. Gay acting characters were seen in plays and films, and a few films even included lesbian relationships. This was all allowed as long as they hid behind the mask of double entendre. One of the women in the sewing circle was Ala Natsumova, the director of Salome, which we looked at earlier as the first art film made in the United States. Another important figure is Eva Le Gallien, who was instrumental in establishing the regional theater movement that will remake American theater in the second half of the 20th century. The four silhouettes of mainstream fashion and the progressive garçon style illustrate the factions developing in society and the expansion of women's roles in the 1920s. The first silhouette, or sheath dress, is a simple tubular shape rejecting the contortions of the figure in prior fashions. It is the first modern fashion shape. By 1925, hemlines shortened to the knee as we see in silhouette number two. A low hip line and rectangular torso provide a canvas for endless variations of decoration. The third silhouette, the robed steel, is a Rococo revival created for women who desired a traditional feminine fashion. 
The most extreme version used panniers to shape the wide skirt. The fourth silhouette introduces dynamic diagonals and softer draping effects, and all throughout the decade, Le Garçon style introduced a progressive androgyny for women that affected even couture fashion.